Hello, and welcome to Traditional Stitches Floss Tube video number 14. I'm Janice Spencer, the owner of Traditional Stitches, and with me today is our Stitch Along leader, Rose Heck. Hello. Hi, Rose. How are you today? Not too bad. How are you, Janice? Good. I'm glad for today because it's mild outside and we are in for a cold snap over the holidays. I know. It'll be inside and staying warm and... If you're into hot toddies, <laughs> it's lots of stitching. Yep. Well, I like the way you think. Let's go yep. with that plan. So today we are meeting to talk about setting up for the Esther Blackwood stitch along, which starts on December 26th. But the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that in the last video that we recorded, we did the drawing for the winner of the antique sampler for the Ann Morrison stitch along. And uh, just today, I got an email from Jennifer, who was our winner, that her antique sampler had arrived. And she took a picture of herself with both her finished Ann Morrison project and her new antique sampler. So I'm going to insert that here. Congratulations again, Jennifer. There's this yes. is just so cool for you um, because even the antique sampler has your initials on it, at least one set. So it was meant to be. Absolutely. Yes. And Jennifer is in New South Wales in Australia. So the sampler actually made it to her in pretty good time considering the way things are. That is awesome. I've seen the posting today, I guess, of, of it and her thanks and I know it can be really fast um, when it's like it's packed very, very well and sent probably with a very fast courier. Nicola is very good for that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so that's very exciting. Our early Christmas present for Jennifer and we're so happy that she won the sampler. So that's yes. exciting. Yeah. Congratulations, Jennifer. So the sampler that we're going to talk about today, Esther Blackwood, there is also going to be an antique sampler prize for the people who finish the stitch along mm -hmm. within the year for Esther's sampler. Mm -hmm. and that sampler is the Martha Guthrie sampler, and I am going to insert a picture of it here just to tempt and tantalize everybody and give them a goal. And we know that it ha can happen, and I've said this before on our videos, but you won one of these contests through Hands Across the Sea Samplers a few years ago, too. That was, it's almost two years ago. So I guess it was for the year 2019 that I won the sampler, and it came January of 2020. Uh, so. Right, because Nicola does that for uh, anybody who finishes one of her samplers and sends her picture. And so the drawing for the 2021 samplers is coming up here pretty quick. She'll do that on the 26th of December as well. Correct. Cool. My name is not on that list. Is your name on that list? I finished Susanna Milne this year. Oh. So she's one of the first samplers, not that she reproduced, um, it was Marianne Bournes, but I think it was her first one. Um, and I finally finished stitching it this year, and, but it, I only had the one. I, I mean, I have Anne, but obviously I wouldn't be putting my name in. So, and, uh, so I put my name in, but um, I know I'm not gonna win and that's fine, I've already won one. So I'm a happy girl for that, so yeah. Good. I see everything's nice and Christmassy there behind you. Yeah, finally. It took me a little bit to get there in one weekend. Hubby Deer said, we need some Christmas cheer in here. So out in came the tree and out came the ornaments. And I got into it. It took me a little bit. But once I started decorating, I thought, oh, this is kind of nice. So, yeah. Well, I am recording in my new um, spare bedroom slash stitching studio. And um, I'm gonna just adjust my monitor here so that you can see what I'll be doing over the holidays. On my spare bed, I have my samplers laid out so that I can start thinking about how I'm gonna arrange hanging them on the wall. 
And is it going to be on that wall behind you? Well, that is the current debate. This okay. wind room has big windows, but they face mostly southwest, which means that they're going to get a lot of sunlight during the day. Mm. And so do I just hang them and be able to enjoy them and not worry about it? Or do I find a different room with a different exposure to hang these. I mean, they are a couple hundred years old, so they've probably done most of their fading and deteriorating already. But my guilty complex, ugh. So I think that when it warms up, maybe I'm going to put some UV film on these windows, just that adhesive stuff, and maybe that'll make me feel a little bit better about it. Hmm. I don't know That's if anybody has... Idea. Any advice or suggestions, please leave a comment below. I'm happy to hear what you do or your input on that thought. Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to hear what other people maybe do. Do you pay attention to that when you hang your antique pieces, Rose? Not, well, not really. I do have a designated room, which is my computer room and it faces it faces east, so it does get the morning sun, but they never are in direct sun at all, ever. So they do get light, but not sun. Hmm. Um, I've even heard, and this might, might not pertain to antique samplers, it may pertain, believe it or not, to clocks, but best not to hang things on outside walls because of the temperature changes. You're, oh. And I don't know if that would apply to antique samplers, that you have cold and warm temperature changes that could, so we're, you know, I'm not given a, a huge house with lots and lots of walls and, a, you know, a designated windowless room for my antique samplers. I think they call that a museum. So, uh, you know. Gotcha. Well, if anybody knows more than us about this and would like to chime in, we will definitely be interested to hear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we'll maybe talk about interesting comments in our next video. Yes. But let's move along to Esther. Yes. So, um, I'll just remind everybody of the sampler that we're talking about. This is our very special Esther Blackwood Canadian reproduction sampler that Nicola has done for our shop. And it is uh, available only through traditional stitches. And I'll link the link below. Um, and it is also a limited edition. So the final print runs have been done. I've got all of the stock in the shop. And once they're gone, they're gone. So. Um, if you're a collector, stasher, now is a really good time to um, add it to your cart. Um, but the other thing is that it will arrive to you not too very long after we've started the stitch along. So you still have plenty of time to catch up. That's right. So we're going to start with talking about prepping the linen for this sampler. So um, it's a good size sampler. The stitch count is 323 by 332. So it's almost square. Mm -hmm. um, so Nicola does such an awesome job on her charts of listing the design size and the fabric cut size on the back. And um, when you are looking at linen, it's important to note the difference between the design size, which would be the actual stitched area that you see versus the cut size of your fabric, which is what you want to include for your fabric margins on the edges to allow for hem stitching, finishing, framing, whatever it is that you choose to do. Um, so Lina, uh, or Nicola does that for the linens here. So um, she lists the different counts and then the design size and then the cut size for the linen, which is just awesome. We really appreciate that. And I, I'm going to give a quick math lesson for those of you that are a little bit concerned about it here. And um, that is because I think that every stitcher has a bit of a responsibility to know how this works. 
uh, for their own projects. And um, you may have a big piece of fabric that you need to cut down. Um, you may have a small piece of fabric that you're trying to fit a design into or laying out a bunch of ornaments. But the other thing is that try as people might, the amazingly awesome staff in needle workshops are human. And sometimes a mistake can get made. A tag can get written up wrong or that kind of thing. So it's still always in the end, the stitcher needs to double check before they start stitching because there's nothing worse than getting into a project and running out of fabric. Have you ever had that, Rose? Personally, no. And here's the reason why. Somebody taught me how to figure out Yes, we're talking you. When I worked that? for you, when I worked for you, you taught me probably day one on how to properly figure out. You did the calculation and it's so easy. So I never, you know, I always, you know, measure twice, cut once. I still do that. Yeah. Errors can happen, but um, no. The only time that it has caught me, I think it just was last week and it was not really a measurement error. It was sometimes you buy a piece of fabric from the manufacturer and it is not cut on the warp or weft, it is just cut. So mm -hmm. you may have 18 inches here and 17 and three quarters or 17 and a half, it may you know change slightly. So that is the one thing you would have to check. And that, that caught me, but it, I still gave myself three inches allowance on each side. So I just take that into consideration and mm -hmm. move with it. So yeah. I had it happen once on a project in a class I was taking where it was a tall, narrow project. So it took um, pretty much the whole width of the bolt of fabric. And over the course of the salvage to salvage length, so 55 inches, the cut was uneven enough so that by the time I reached the bottom I only had like three or four threads on the edge. Oh no. Yeah so but you, we, you and I have an awesome framer and so she was able to work with that and get it solved but um, yeah. What? Yeah so always stitchers, always double check your linen before you start um, stitching because there's nothing more heartbreaking than having put in dozens and dozens of hours and not and running into a problem like that right, right. Yeah. yeah so um rose for esther blackwood's project um you and i are using different materials this time uh -huh. we use yeah. the same for the ann morrison sampler but we're going to uh -huh. go different pathways this time uh -huh. you're using the 46 count lakeside linens uh -huh. in uh the color is vintage pecan butter Mm -hmm. and uh, the SWA 100 over 3, the silk thread right. on the spools. Yeah. yeah, all ready to go. Cool. So your sampler is going to end up being your design size is going to be a sweet size of about 14 inches by about 14 and a half inches. That's right. I'm going to stitch mine on the same color of linen. So mm -hmm. like I said, linens, vintage pecan butter, but on mm -hmm. the 40 count with the SWA LJ. So my design size is going to be just over 16 inches by 16.6 mm -hmm. inches. So there is less than half an inch difference in the dimensions. So we're going to roughly call her square. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Alrighty. So I'm going to run through the math real quick. And then when I edit the video, I'm going to put the math in the bar underneath so that you can follow along with what I'm saying and pause it and make notes or take screenshots, whatever you want to do that makes sense to you. So um, I'm gonna start with the width of our sampler, which is 323 stitches wide. So um, the Esther Blackwood sampler is cross stitch over two. Charted for that, uh, the original was that. Um, for those of you who enjoy cross stitch over one, you could actually do this sampler this way um, because there is only a little bit, this sawtooth border right here is the only thing that is not cross stitch over two. So if you wanted to do it over one and make something up for that border, you could totally do that. And what a tiny, dainty, beautiful little sampler that would be. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Good for those that do it. <laughs> but we're going to do our math for over two. So um, I don't know if you remember from high school math, that's, um, but when you're doing these kinds of things, you want to have everything in the same units, you know, inches, centimeters, pounds, whatever it is you're talking about, you need to get your numbers in the same units. So we know that we have 323 stitches, which is cross stitch over two, so 646 threads. That's how wide our sampler is gonna be, 646 threads. And so then you divide that number by your threads per inch count of your fabric. So you're going to take your six, 46, and in my case, I'm going to divide it by 40 because I'm working on 40 count. And in your case, you're going to divide by 45 count. And that is going to give you your design size in inches. Right. And then we always add in the shop uh, six inches to each dimension. So three inches on the sides, each of the sides, three inches on the top, three inches on the bottom. So six inches to each dimension for how we actually cut the fabric. And that's exactly what Nicola has listed on the back of the chart is a six inch framing allowance in each dimension. Is that still how you think about that? That's, that is the only way I do it. Yeah. Um, I don't even have to think about it. I can, well, especially with 40 count, I can do it quickly in my head. Um, it's it just, yeah, it's so second nature to me. Yeah. So. And so sometimes on charts, you see where they will list the design size, they will list the fabric size, the cut size, they use different terminology and you need to be clear on what they're talking about, whether you still need to add your framing allowance or what they're talking about includes your framing allowance. Yeah. And three inches is generous. Um, a lot of places I know do just two inches, but it gives you some leeway, like what we were talking about. If you're, um, if it's not cut exactly straight, or um, yeah, or what if you decided that you wanted to add a border to the bottom, just a band, or your uh, name, or something like that. It it gives you more leeway, and it gives your framer more leeway, more options for how to frame your project when it's done. Correct. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's it's not it's not a waste when it gives you a comfortable margin that you don't have to sweat. Even a piece that I have that I know that I'm only going to have scant two inches that I'm okay with it because I know it's within my framing um, ability or my framer's framing ability. Right. And being aware of it is also part of the, yeah. if you know that you've got scant margins, you need to know it and plan for it and be aware of it, not get into your project and then go, ooh, these are scant margins. Yeah. The one thing that uh, people can do is if this is their piece of fabric, you can always check, let's say you need to have 18 inches here, check what's down here. If this is supposed to be 27, check here. So if this one doesn't line up with this one and this one doesn't line up with this one, um, you're gonna have to make a decision on, you know, what you're doing with that piece of fabric. If you've got plenty there or if it's not the right piece of fabric, you know, move on. Um, check with your framer also, if you have a framer, that can work with minimal margins. And if you know that, okay. Um, you and I have a really good framer that can work with minimal margins, but not every framer is comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk about cutting our fabric to size. Mm -hmm. So the people who received uh, the legacy linen in their kit, ordered and received the legacy linen, their fabric is gonna be cut more to the design size uh, than the lakeside linens. Oh. We, um, we were particularly lucky to get lakeside linens to um, 
step on board with this project with us. So we were all about making it as easy as possible on them. So we chose to go with one of their standard cut size for this sampler, which means that we all have excess fabric. So I'm gonna talk about how we're gonna deal with that. So everybody who got a lake, piece of lakeside linens um, got a stitcher's half mm -hmm. of linen. So that means it's 36 inches along the salvage by about 27 inches, and then it was cut at the fold of the bolt. Mm -hmm. And this is an oversized piece for this project. Mm -hmm. So on my piece of fabric, the Nicholas list says that the cut size should be 22.15 by 22.6. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that, um, average it out to say 22.5 for easy math. Does that make yeah. sense? Okay, so my piece of fabric needs to be 22.5 inches square. So I'm going to, so this is 27. So I need 22 and a half. So that is four and a half inches doing this math on the fly. So I'm gonna have this much extra fabric on this of the sampler, but this is gonna be my height of my sampler is gonna go along this way. So I'm fine with leaving that on. When the sampler is done, I'll cut it off and it will make a sweet little ornament. It would make a bookmark. It would make an awesome doodle cloth for practicing your stitches on. So, uh, but I'm gonna wait until it's done to cut that off. Okay. Um, but what I'm going to do, tape measure here. I'm gonna measure 22 and a half, and I have a Pigma pen. And I'm just gonna make a mark on my linen right near the edge in the border where that 22 and a half is. So this is gonna be my cut mark there. And then this mm -hmm. shows my direction. And so this is gonna be well in my margin of my fabric. So it doesn't matter that I wrote on it. No, no. Then, on the salvage edge of the fabric, I'm also going to measure over 22 and a half. And also make a mark. And this is where I am going to cut my fabric down. So this is my mark. Mm -hmm. This is the 22 and a half inch side. So this is gonna be my sampler bit this way. And then from the mark to this is gonna be what I have left over, which is going to be approximately 14 inches, 13 to 14 inches. So that's a really good sampler size. So I wanna leave that piece intact, absolutely. So I'm going to cut here, make a label, measure it out, put it in a bag, put it in my stash so I know exactly what it is and what it measures so that it's right ready to go for the next project. So do you have a theory on linen about whether you need to stitch along the selvage or not along the selvage? I was, as you were talking, I was just thinking of that. And oh, gosh, somebody had mentioned that a while ago that they thought it was better to work with the selvage that the stitches laid better or it was easier to stitch and I'm not sure but do I do that no it's whatever I'm very uh, I hate to say it but I'm very Dutch when it comes to um being, yeah I I like to be efficient and I don't want to waste fabric mm -hmm. and I've never had you know, where I'd say, oh, gee, I wish I had turned this and stitched the other way. I'm sure it would have been so much easier. If anybody has found that, I would like to hear, mention in the comments below, because I'd really like to know. Mm -hmm. So no, I didn't worry. I think that is more of an old school mentality. Um, maybe, I don't, I don't know, but yes, I'm yeah. sure somebody has an answer. Um, there's, there's the, they people that 
there are rules, but I am, um, I'm all about getting it done, right? I would much rather get into a project and enjoy it and have a finished item to share than worrying too much about getting it right. So then the other part of that gets to be, is there a right or a wrong side of your fabric? I never so, thought of that. Some of the fabrics, and it's not so much anymore, but some of the fabrics you could see a sheen on them from the way that they were wrapped, rolled on the mill. Like you think about when you press a hoop onto your fabric and sometimes you get a little bit of a different sheen on. Anyways, um, so my theory is the side of the fabric that is the right side is the side that you like the best. So hold it back and look at it and see, oh, I really like that splotch. I want to make sure that that's on my sampler or, um, you know, the, this side seems to be a little bit more brown to me. I really like that. I'm going to choose yeah. that side. Yeah. Take, you, hear take people talk, you hear people talking about it when they're working with highly hand-dyed fabrics, things that have quite definite splotches and they will look and sometimes if they want a little more sub subtle variation versus really strong they will pick one side over another or one area yeah. for that i can see but the orientation or one side is more sheen than the other i've never really seen it yeah. um, the other exception of course is the zweigert uh your the vintage the vintage country mochas and the smoky you know which ones I mean. There are yep. ones that are printed. Yep. That's even then. I've heard people working on the wrong side because they don't want the hand dyed look. So yeah, and sometimes the fabric that's on the other side, the color of those vintage stamped ones, is really really nice. So do it yeah. if you like it yeah. better. Do it. Yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can find my cut mark now that I scrunched up the fabric. So I'm not actually going to cut this, but I'm going to tell you how I would cut it. So you can do this underneath your magnifier if you like, if that makes you feel better. Yeah, so take good scissors. And some people like really long bladed scissors for cutting fabric, but it doesn't matter. So these happen to be Fiskars with the spring in them. And so you're gonna go to your mark and you're gonna cut through the salvage and then once you get past that point, you can decide whether you can see it well enough to just follow the grain of your fabric and cut that way. And if you're off a thread or here, here or there, it's not going to change anything. Um, but you do want to try to be pretty accurate on that. The other thing that you can do is once you cut through that selvage, is you can pick out a thread on either side of where you're cutting and pull it a little bit so that it will scrunch up your fabric for a couple of inches. Do you use that technique? Once or twice, but I always remember one gal that used to work for you that did it and you didn't mind except it does, it, it scrunches up the fabric and it's hard to get it to smooth out. So, yeah. so I, I've, if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna, it's called pulling a thread. If you're gonna pull the thread, just do it for a couple of inches, which your linen thread will snap if you try to do any more than that anyway. So you do a couple of inches and then cut, and then pull a couple of inches and then cut. Don't try to pull the whole length of your fabric because what Rose was talking about, where it gets wavy and then it's hard to get out. You can press it out, but um, yeah. And then just go all the way to the end and then you've got fabric for two projects. Or more even maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I already did mine the other day when I thought, oh gosh, I gotta have this prepped for um, starting at least this video. So I got out all my stuff and I use my, I have good magnifying lamps. I don't need to pull a thread. So that works. And, and I thought it was an error on your part because I had this huge piece of fabric and I didn't need the whole thing. And because being on scroll rods, I need it to fit the scroll rods. And so I had to cut it down. And so I looked at the what I had left over and I went, this is enough for another sampler. It's like, woohoo. <laughs> yeah. So like you said, I take, 
I take the label that always comes um, with the fabric from the stitching store and I cross it out and I rewrite what it is, put it in my drawer for, you know, someday when I need to stash dive and I have a special treat. So. Yeah. Perfect. Well, and it's such beautiful linen and in such a nice color that I knew Thank nobody you. would be sad about having it in their stash. That's for sure. Okay, so then the last thing to talk about is uh, finishing the edges of your fabric. Yeah. So when, so the lake side, the big, the big piece that you've got is zigzagged all the way around, but now we're going to cut an edge so you don't have a zigzag. So do right. you, well, how, what do you do? I have a serger. Ah. So, if you can see that, so I serge right away. I don't like uh, I don't like raveled edges. It it annoys me. I don't you know it comes undone and it catches in your your thread you're stitching with. No, so I clean it up right away. How about you? Well, unfortunately, we don't have the space in the shop to have a serger, although it's fairly high up on my wish list. Um, so, if my sewing machine was out. I would just run a zigzag stitch mm -hmm. just to keep everything together. Um, my sewing machine is not out. I could hand zigzag it, but um, I really just want to start stitching. So I might skip that step. <laughs> okay, so then the next question on fabric prep is to baste or not to baste? That is the question. So uh, if you are a person who's not comfortable with doing the math, or cutting your fabric, basting before you do any cutting is, would be a really great idea. So if you just took a piece of regular sewing thread and basted the actual um, 323 stitches wide and 332 stitches high on your fabric, then you would have the confidence to cut it. So that is a tool there. The other thing about this sampler is that it has a border that goes all the way around. Mm -hmm. And so if you're one of those, okay, no judgment here, crazy people who wants to do all of their border before they start filling in, um, then you might want to baste just to keep your stitches, your spot in your stitches going um, as you put it in the border. There are so many people that like to border stitch. You know who you are. I don't have to name names. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it's cool, I, you know, but I'm scared of going off and that, I can't leave things, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I, you know, move forward, not backwards type of thing. So oh, what a heck of an accomplishment that would be if you were just yeah. stitching that border and it met at the end. I just, I Okay, but we're actually, we're gonna talk a little bit about more about strategy further down my notes. So you talked about mounting your sampler on scroll frames. That's what you're gonna use? Right, correct. Okay, um, that is probably what I'm gonna do too is my needlework system for stand mounted on scroll rods for that. Um, I used to really be an in-hand stitcher. I used to stitch everything just you know, scrunch it up in my hand and then I could use a sewing method. And um, everybody used to always comment on how fast of a stitcher I was. Um, but I'm going more and more away from that. And um, that is because I don't like my project to be scrunchy. I, I feel more uh, happy with my progress and um, my results and just the whole process, if it's nicely stretched and pretty. And um, I don't know, I have a piece on the go, um, it's downstairs on my couch, um, that is a small piece that I'm stitching in hand. And it's all scrunchy uh -huh. on the edge from holding uh -huh. it, but, but it was uh -huh. perfect for that. I will do little things in hand. I don't mind that. And I can do big things in hand too. It, it tires my hand a little bit. Being that I work with my hands as a living, I don't need to add to the, you know, fatigue in my hands, but I like, and, and maybe it comes down to being a little bit OCD. I like the neatness of scroll rods and how it is and that the end of the day, you can look at it and go, oh, it's, you know, just so nice and that the stitches are laying nicely. And I'm not saying that they don't lay nicely, 
for somebody else. It is just my own own thing. I just like that neatness and that, I don't know. It, it's just something. Yeah. Well, we're on the same side on that one. Yeah. Um, I did want to talk about some other options though. Um, when we were brainstorming subjects in the shop yesterday about the video, we were talking about um, hoops as an option yeah. and Kathleen said that this sampler would probably lend itself okay to using a hoop because yeah. there's so much white space in between and motifs and stuff that you could maybe strategize a little bit about. Um, my concern with hoops is always that the on off action over top of the areas that you've already stitched is going to pull at your stitches or change the sheen of your silk or that kind of thing. <sighs> Yeah, I, yes and no. And I think there are some things that you can do to get around that is um, with hoop frames, they suggest that you pad it with your twill tape. So that will give it some, some padding. You could probably also use, uh, I don't know, you know, something, some cushy fabric like flannel or something to kind of, you know, absorb that, that stretching. But yeah, I think the bottom line is, is when you're done in the day with the hoop, take it out of the hoop to prevent yes. that. Yes. And actually, I would say that I think that the most important thing about using a hoop is when you're putting it on and taking it off to have it be quite loose so that you're not actually popping it on over top of if the areas that you stitch. That's the thing that I'm most worried about is what you've already stitched that's going to get pinched beside the sides yeah. of the hoop. Yeah. So if you loosen off your bolt quite loosely and then put your outer ring on and then tighten it up, then you're not going to have that same popping friction and wear. I don't know. Right. Again, um, ideas, comment below. Yeah. Hear it. Being that I'm not a hoop stitcher, I like the idea but I'm not a hoop stitcher. So like you said, if anybody has really good success with stitching with hoops and some tips and tricks that they can share with us. So I really like hoops for embroidery projects or projects that fit within the size of the hoop. I, I love to use a hoop for that because a hoop just feels so good in your hands. And, um, but it's the, the overlapping bits that concern me. Yeah, yeah. So then we were going to talk a little bit about Q-snaps and I kind of feel exactly, okay, I definitely feel exactly the same way about Q-snaps. And you were showing me a project. Um, yeah. Started that you so I'm, I'm working on um, a project and this is actually um, Jeanette Douglas's mini bouquet sampler stitch along, the one that she's offering for free. So. And we'll I link that below. Okay, it, and it's, it's just a really sweet, and it may or may not stay in this. Um, I may end up putting it in a scroll rod. But what I like about this is I can put this into my needlework stand. I can work on it in bed in the morning for an hour. It can sit on my lap and I can stitch along with it. I Do I, sorry. So I see that you do have fabric in between your sleeves. Yes. Is that to tighten things up a bit or? Um, it's, it's actually, they're just strips of felt and it's actually to kind of cushion the grip part so that it's not so harsh on the stitches. Yeah. It, it does help to grip too, because I noticed when I started this, my, these pieces are not, the sleeves, the sleeves are not, they're a bit loose. Yeah, they loosen so, up over time. Yeah. I. Somebody somewhere gave a suggestion on how to tighten these, and I don't remember what it is, but, you know, a piece of fabric, you know, something cushy. Um, I wouldn't really go with quilt batting just because you get the, the fibers from the quilt batting, but something that has a little bit of cushion would really make a difference, and it hmm. does. So do I take this out when I'm done with it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm do as I say, not do as I do. So, mm -hmm. but that is another option. Okay. The other thing that Kathleen asked me to make sure to mention to everybody was that um, when you're not working on your project, whether in, okay. In scroll frames, if you're going to set your project aside for a couple of weeks, a few weeks till the next month of the stitch along, relax the tension 
off of your fabric. Just loosen your wing nuts or whatever so that it's not as taut. That'll be good for both your scroll rods and your fabric. Um, and hoops, if for a project like this, always, always take it off when you're not using it. Not even like just when you're done stitching for the night, take the outer ring off. And then definitely if you're going to set it aside for a little while, take it out of the hoop or the Q-snap. As I'm sitting here listening, my left hand is slowly listening. <laughs> I'm really, I, with my needlework stand, I always loosen it, I, just automatic. But with the Millennium, I'm really bad. I just, I'm done in the night. I shut the light off, I go to bed. So, yeah. Yeah, but you're or probably I, going back to it the next day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't. For Esther Blackwood, she's not going to stay in the scroll rods. I'll work on her until that month part is done. Then I'll take her out, stick her in my project bag until the next month. Cool. All right. So now we're going to talk about threads. So before, while I was waiting for our meeting time, I started putting my Soie d'Alger skeins into floss wave bags. And so I don't always write the number. There's a little white area here where you can use pen to write the number on it. And I don't always do that. But when I do tuck it in, I just make sure that I can see the number through the bottom edge of the bag. And then I'll put these all onto a ring. And what about you? I do the same, but I always, pardon me. I always put the number and then I put the uh, symbol of the name. So in this way, this is SWA 103. Yeah, just swing it the other Sorry, way. Um, there we go. Yeah, okay, so Sorry S100 that. over three just for the exactly. type of the thread. Exactly. Cool. So that works for me. And then I do put it on, I have a variety of either rings or these handy dandy little flexible things. They're like luggage tags generally, I think. Hey? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they screw and unscrew. So yeah, I've got a variety of both. I'll grab whatever yeah. works for me. So, um, yeah, I'm not a fan. Uh, don't bobbinate your silk. And um, no. No. I just whatever you do, treat it gently. And the biggest thing there is you just, silk has such a beautiful sheen to it that you yes. don't want to be scraping it across cardboard or anything like that that might break that up because it's well, just... Here's an alternative. I have a little cutter. Now people are really getting into these floss tags, right? They order from Vista Print and they make. That's great. I happen to have a floss cutter and I'll then cut it out, make a larger hole, make a smaller hole and I'll put silk on it or, or DMC, whatever type of thing. Um, and the other thing is, is those wonderful laser cutter uh, floss cards. I have one, it's over there. And I might've got, I think I got it through one of the stitch alongs. Hang your floss from that, um, but don't put it in bobbins. It, it really kinks them up. It's, it's hard on them. Yeah. Yeah. Question for you. Okay. Do you know how the, <laughs> this is an easy one. The swa comes with a knot at the end. Swa d'Alger? Yes. Yes. Do you does. cut it off or do you undo the knot? Uh, in this case, see the little knot? That's, I okay. can't really see it, but it's right there. I cut yep. it off. Okay. Yeah. So, but if it was like a skein of Gloriana or something like that, that's not quite such tiny little knot, I unpick it. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. Okay. All right. Okay. Needles. Let's talk about needles. Yes. So our favorite brand of needles in the shop is the Bowens. Bowen Tapestry Needles. This is a pack of 28. And um, so this, this is my go-to tapestry needle. Um, a note on needle size is that people in the Ann Morrison stitch along found that if they went to a larger size needle, that the silk 
was better. And um, so I applied that to a project um, that I'm stitching on that's black silk and it made a huge difference. But when you go to a larger needle size, if you're going from a 28, don't go to a 26, go all the way to a 24 and see how much difference that makes for your silk mm -hmm. like Soie d'Alger. Mm -hmm. um, but those of you that are using the 100 over 3, like you are, Rose, mm -hmm. probably want to use these guys, which is the ball point, so blunt, um, also tapestry point. Sometimes they're called short beading needles from John James. Mm -hmm. And that'll help you get that thread into those tight little corners. And because um, the, the weave of the linen when you're talking 45, 46 count linen is quite tight. Mm -hmm. And I will go back and forth. With Anne, I did go back and forth. And like you said, in the tight spots where there's a lot of stitching, I use the number 10s. And then I would go back to the 28. But the biggest thing that I found made a difference, and you're going to laugh, is having a fresh needle. Oh. I'm really bad for using like an older needle type of thing. And I was having some difficulties. So I went, let's just grab one from the pack. And it made, it was night and day. Hmm. It was, I couldn't believe it. So just okay. swap it out for a brand new needle. Yeah. So my question, I was going to ask you that, you jumped the gun on me, oh, was right. how long you use a needle for. So I was reading a Facebook group yesterday and a lady said that she only uses two needles all year long. So I thought either she doesn't get very much stitching done or she doesn't maybe realize how much of a difference a fresh needle makes. Like this Esther Black wood sampler is so big that um, you should probably plan on using three or four needles to get through the, okay. the life of this sampler to make the stitching more enjoyable and the silk look more lovely and Needles are so inexpensive and don't hesitate to change them out. The other thing is that both of these types of needles that I showed, the bow and tapestry needles and the John James beading needles are available in bulk. So we have them in 25 packs, which makes them very affordable and um, yeah. Yeah. incentivizes yeah. you to change your needle a little bit more frequently, I think. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then for those of us that need more than one needle on our project, we need needle minders. This is my favorite needle minder. <laughs> Does that surprise you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we carry these in the shop. They're from Accoutrements Designs and um, really nice rare earth magnet on the back so it's really strong and um, if you've got a few needles on the go just put it on your project and they're right there for you you don't have to look for them uh -huh. so then anything more on that one thing that somebody and i wish i could remember who was talking about the 103s and they said because it's wound in a bobbin sometimes it still has that memory which is why sometimes it can knot up because it's still thinking in terms so um that kind of gave me a new perspective on using 103s because it's a love-hate relationship uh, with 103s but i'm not ready to give up yet on it because it 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 is nice so always shorter needles or shorter threads fresh needles letting it wind down. Um, I don't use thread conditioners ever. Very rarely, very rarely. Um, on one of those nights that I'm a little bit upset, I might, but no. <laughs> so I, I'm going to crinkle a bag here because I want to show you something. Okay. So swallow 100 over three, like you were saying, I'm just going to Somebody told, taught me this a long time ago for working with Krynic Metallics that came off of a spool and had a little bit of a memory. This guy doesn't actually have too much of a memory. Not it's too not too kinky. But so cut your length, grab each end and give it a tug. And that should help get everything back into alignment. So try that the next time you have a swirly <laughs> one and see if that makes any difference. 
just give it a little bit of a tug. They used to have a tool on the market that was a thread straightener and it just kind of, you grab two rods and you wrap the ends around and you gave it a pull and that was the premise there. So. Oh, I remember that product. But I didn't know what it was for. <laughs> I guess I should have asked. Oh uh, well. Um, so then you need to have a nice storage bag for your project. So there are so many beautiful people, storage bag makers out there. Um, I happen to have this one. <laughs> that looks familiar. Yeah, who made that for me? Gee, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I love these bags, but the problem is I never know what's on them. So cleverly, you included a little cardboard yeah. tag where I can write what the project is, but inevitably I'm zipping, unzipping to yeah. see what's in them. So I actually use a lot of these mesh zippered bags. So you can see what's in them. And yeah, so they're really good. And you can get one that's nice and tight for your project like that, or they come in quite a bit bigger sizes for if you want to put a frame or your key snap or whatever in there. So those are options, but it's always nice to treat a brand new project to its very own bag, whichever route you go. Yep, I agree. I've got mine all ready, so. Oh, how pretty. Yeah, I made a few of these for sisters. And I thought, oh, you know what? I think that would be good for Esther. So Esther has got her own place. So, awesome. But I don't have a needle minder. I'll, I've got so many that I've made that I'll, I'll pull a couple. I usually end up having two or three on a project. Do you like to thread uh, needles? Like, especially if you're working with one color, do you... It's not really something that I've done, but I haven't really, until now, had the luxury of spreading out a little bit. So maybe, okay. I, could, okay. maybe I could do that. Um, the other thing is that, um, so my project's going to be on my scroll frame on my floor stand. And at night when I am done stitching, I always just cover it with a pillowcase. Yeah. I'm over the top careful about keeping my projects clean because... I don't want to um, have to wash them, especially if they're with silk. I don't, I do whatever I can to avoid. If I have to wash it, well, we'll deal with that, but I don't really want to. Mm -hmm. And so that actually brings me back to something that I meant to talk about earlier that you had said was you had somebody reach out to you and ask about how to get creases out of fabric. Yeah. And so the first thing to try is to um, mist a little bit of water directly on the crease and press it, don't iron it, but press it with your linen setting on your iron. Um, but with a caveat to that is that you have to know the brand of fabric that you're using. Um, the hand dyed linen like the Lakeside is color fast, but still test it. So cut off a little corner snippet and see what the color does. Put it on a white towel or a white piece of paper towel when you're pressing your test piece and see what the color does. If it's still white, that's great. But there are some fabrics where the color actually migrates. So if you got a drop of water on it, it would spread out to be a water spot. And so you just really want to be careful before you add any water to your fabric. Mm -hmm. um, this piece of lakeside linens, I wouldn't, if, so back up. If there's a crease that won't press out, then the best thing to do is to submerge your fabric. Just the whole piece of linen in cool water after you've tested it, of course. And um, then press it dry from there. So um, squish it out. Squish out as much water as you can. Don't wring it, just squish it. And then roll it in a white terry towel, uh, bath towel to get as much out as you can. And then on a dry towel, press it. Don't iron it, press it. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you than pressing because it's such a, well, linen is a loose weave compared to a fabric, you know, of our clothing. So it has a real potential to skew out of 
um, out of the warp and weft. And so you have a, what's the word I'm looking for? You can distort it just it. distorts, distorts, yeah. So it's best just to press it and mm -hmm. work on, on those. And the other thought is as you work with it with, you know, the heat of your hands and being whether it's in a scroll frame or otherwise, it will soften and loosen. And then you're usually stitching over. I don't have one piece, like I said to you before, that has any uh, creases in it because they just disappear over time. Mm -hmm. so, hmm. But yeah, if it's a concern, you know, your tips, what you said are valid. They should yeah. work. Just test anything before you yeah. are going to commit your full piece of fabric to it, yeah. for sure. And there's lots of ideas and uh, videos and that kind of thing about that online as yeah. well, if you're looking yeah. for specific suggestions. One thing that we don't have here in Alberta, where we live, is um, lots of bugs that would eat our fabric. Because we're such a dry climate, we don't have to worry about... Um, not that we would add it, but like um, like lambswool linen that I'm using for that scarlet letter sampler, it comes fairly heavily starched. And some people will want to wash that as much as they can out, but we don't need to worry so much about that because we don't have the climate that would cater to that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so then back to things. So then, in each of Nicola's samplers, she includes a card that is the uh -huh. thread list, but on the back is a place to record your sampler. So you put your name on there, your start date, record the fabric that you used, threads that you used, and any modifications that you made. Um, keep that with you, keep track of it, and then when you get your sampler framed, on the backing paper, tape this down to the backing paper so that years in the future, you'll be able to refer back to it and know yeah. all the details. Yeah. Or you can keep track of your project in one of these. The 2022 Book of Days. Um, so it's got full pages like this. And so you could say stitched on Esther Blackwood, three hours. Want to look like that and you can do stickers apparently <laughs> yeah yeah okay so let's talk about our stitch along plan so we're starting on sunday december the 26th yes. right that's our special start date um and that's also the Hands Across the Sea anniversary date. So we're happy to be celebrating extra things on that date. Correct. And you are going to do a short uh, Facebook Live as you put in your first few stitches. You think you'll be able to find a willing grandchild to hold your phone to? Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> it, I'm hoping that I'll do it early enough that they're still sleeping. Mm -hmm. So Rob, Rob said he would hold it. So I might be able to do it, set it up in the living room and just get my coffee brewed and have a couple minutes of putting in the first stitches. Right. So I have, I have to confess, uh -oh. just find it. No, 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 it's all good, it's all good. I just am flipping my linen here. Oh, there it is. I have the pin stitch already. In. Oh, that reminds me, I forgot to talk about corner gauges. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So these corner gauges are, so starting your project, we said that we include three inches on each side for your framing allowance. So this corner gauge conveniently is three inches. So if you line up one corner with the cut edge of your fabric, square it up, and then you just go straight to this edge, that's your starting point. So easy peasy. It also has holes along here for one inches and two inches if you needed to um, have a scanter framing allowance or if you're stitching an ornament that you knew that you were going to cut the excess off for finishing anyways. Right, right. So right. this corner gauge is from the Eliza Martha Linfoot stitch along and we still have some of these left and they were made by our great friend Kathy Ray at Needle in a Haystack in California. 
And then we also have this style, which is incredibly pretty. And so that's wood with the picture is engraved and then stained on the top. And then it's got the markers for two inch, two and a half inch, three inches along the edge there. So it works exactly the same way. So okay. if, you, if you like tools and you think that would be helpful for you, then I encourage you to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're gonna do a quick Facebook Live. We both have family uh, that we haven't seen for a long time in town that weekend. So um, you might not have a whole lot of time to stitch, but I'll put in my first stitches that day too. You're right, yeah. And like I said, it, it probably will be first thing in the morning, um, just a couple minutes with my cup of coffee put in, like I said, I have the pin stitch, but put in the first couple of stitches you know, and, and go from there and just get people started in the right direction. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and such a fun thing to do together. And uh, our um, Esther Blackwood group is uh, transitioning from what was our Ann Morrison Facebook group. Uh, so we know that it's an awesome community and there's lots of great stitchers in there that um, will be supporting and cheering us on all the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so true. Yeah. So, um, if you're going to do that in the wee hours, though, what would that be? Like, if I well, wanted to tell it's people... Not be, it's not going to be no earlier than 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Correct. Our I'm, time zone. I don't know if the girls will sleep in, my two granddaughters that will be upstairs next to us. So, I'll probably tippy-toe out, kick in the... Um, coffee maker and uh I mean if they get up they can you know quietly <laughs> watch so and I guess if you hear them it's okay it's uh, it's Christmas tis the season yep yeah and, that's right and what else is Christmas but through the eyes of kids that age hmm? exactly by the time you get to my age it's a little bit it, it looks a little different so. mm -hmm. okay so our First month of the stitch along, do this on this side. Um, we're going to go down to this border that is just above the green alphabet. That's the first month assignment. Do you want me to show you the, oh, yeah. the grid? Please. I think you can see the there. Your pink number one in the middle there. Correct. And your blue dividing line. Right. Gotcha. It's also on the Facebook page, I have it under announcements and files. I figured out how to put something in files. It only took me a year, but okay, good. that's okay. So refer back to that. And like with Anne, it's always, it's not written in stone. It's very loose. <coughs> if you want to go on, if you want to do more of the border, um, this is your stitch along. It's not traditional stitches stitch along as far as she's not cracking the whip. It's not my stitch along. It's, you know, let's have fun. Yeah, what everybody wants to make it for themselves. Exactly. exactly. Cool. So um, we we're talking a little bit about border strategy and working our way down and some people yeah. that might choose to um, go through and do the border all at once. I meant to have a look and see if there were any, um, you know, in some samplers, how the border is not predictable all the way around. And I meant to have a look and see if there were any instances in this for Esther sampler, but I didn't get a chance to. So I yeah. know that. Yeah. And then um, I think both of our plans is to work the side borders down as we do the bands that are in between, or as the length of our thread that we have in our needle dictates, right? So if you get a few yeah. extra leaves in the border, we're going to be fine with that. But what that really lets you do is what we've called landmarking in past videos, where it gives you more than one place to count off your stitches from for your accuracy. Yeah. That's think, exactly what I'll be doing. Yeah, I'm so much more comfortable doing that than going so for the full board. As a for example, actually, let me use a centerfold because it'll be a bit bigger. Yeah, agreed. So on this edge border, if you're going to start with this yellow and green, you'd have the red band in that you can count from, but
but you'd also have your border on the edge that you could double count in from just to ensure your accuracy. And then that also helps if you do make a mistake, you're not too, too far in before you realize yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that works. Good. All right, well, that was quite a, a list of things, but I think, yeah. I think we got through them. I think so. I don't think there's anything else that we didn't haven't covered. I think we did it all. Good, so. good. So that is just so that everybody knows all the information that they need. And over the next few days, if you can squirrel away a little bit of time for yourself, you can get your project ready to go. So yeah. that just like Rose, when you get up in the morning of the 26th, you can just put in your first few special stitches, even if that's all that you get done that day, and it'll be a celebration. Exactly. And for those that are watching this, if it is 710, and you don't see anything yet, don't text me, <laughs> don't <laughs> private message me, don't send, don't, you know, send alarms to wake me up. I'll get no. there, I'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yep. Just watch for that on our Facebook group yeah. at some point on the 26th. Yeah, exactly. It'll be the morning, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, Rose, I hope you have a great Christmas and you enjoy spending the time with your people this year. Thank you. And the same with you, Janice, with having a houseful or yeah. near houseful. Yeah, yeah. Company from out of town that we haven't seen in a very long time. Yeah. So, nice. yeah. yeah, it will be great. Um, and stay warm because it's going to get cold. It is. Yeah. I kind of ignored the temperatures, but um, I think this is our last day of nice temperatures. Yeah. But what would life in Alberta be if we didn't have minus three <laughs> degrees Celsius Christmases, right? Oh, that's right. You just bundle one more layer and... Yeah, exactly. So then um, I enjoy talking to you so much. We should do this more often than once a month. But at this point, the plan is that we will do another video at the end of January. So we'll tackle anything that's come up as people got started during the month of January and get everybody prepared and launched to go into the February stitch along for the first of the month of February. Right, right. Well, that sounds so weird. Just, you know, second month, I, yeah. What a, before you know it, it'll be done. That's Just what like Anne was, it. yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well. All right. Well, nice to visit with you. It was good to visit with you. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. You too. Thank you. All right. Take care, Rose. Be safe. Be kind. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs>